Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of the Real Health Podcast with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Real Health Podcast in association with Leia Healthcare with me, Carl Henry. Folks, this is the second of our Health Masterclass episodes. I really hope you enjoyed last week's episode, that you weren't too embarrassed and that maybe you went to uh, the sex shop online and bought some lovely stuff for you and your partner. Uh, Anyway, moving swiftly on as our whole studio gets embarrassed. um, On today's episode, we're going to chat about your brain health and uh, having slung down the aging process of the brain and having a younger brain. Huge topic, no one's really covered it. As ever, it's an exclusive for the Real Health Podcast. I'm delighted to be joined in studio by Dr. Sabina Brennan, neuroscientist and author of 100 Days to a Younger Brain. Sabina, how are you? I'm great, thanks for having me, Carl. Not at all, thank you for coming in. So chat to me all about uh, brain health. Why is it important? And, um, you know, what's, what's, what's the big sell? Well, yeah, the big sell is you need your brain for everything. Um, And it's kind of funny, really. You know, you brush your teeth every day. um, And most of us don't spare a a thought for our brain health. Um, But there isn't one thing that you can do without your brain. And I mean, thankfully, we talk about physical health. And uh, we're now more often talking about mental health. Mm -hmm. But nobody really was talking about brain health. And that that just seemed kind of crazy to me. Um, And uh, I mean, your brain is an organ. Uh, like any other organ in your body, but it's really the master controller of everything that you do. Um, Your brain is shrinking, if you're over 30, that is. From the age of 30, your brain starts to shrink um, through a process called atrophy, which means you lose brain cells and connections between them, hit 60, and that accelerates. Um, So um, brain health matters. And the good news is, like, this is a good news story. Um, The the good news thing, your brain is constantly changing. Um, And it's your behaviours, your experiences, the life choices that you make that can shape it at any age. So it's never too late to start. It's also never too early to start, to be perfectly honest. Um, And what we know is that if you live a brain healthy life, which um, excludes smoking, um, includes physical exercise, um, includes social engagement, mental stimulation, healthy diet and optimal amounts of sleep and stress you can actually stave off um, the rate at which that shrinking occurs and actually can maintain your brain size and your brain function. Um, So it's a real big, you know, I mean, it's a genuine big payoff. And I mean, that's all grounded in in science. You know, this isn't anything just plucked out of the air. (laughs) So you can slow down the rate at which your brain ages. That that's basically it. By if you judge, a, yeah, brain aging by the fact that it after you know that it shrinks. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Mm. Wow. Yes. And um, it's kind of exciting news, isn't it? Can you see why it's a whole area. it surprised me that nobody was really talking about it? Amazing. And t- okay, let's t- um, screen time. Yes. Does that affect your brain and the, and the rate at which it ages? Somebody asked well, me this earlier on when I was coming in. They said, oh my God, make sure you ask about screen time. Yeah, like, okay. no, 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 I will ask about screen time. That's really very interesting um, for a number of reasons. As I just said to you, um, it's your behaviours, your life experiences that shape your brain. Um, our conversation is shaping your brain. You know, what, what, what we do, your brain is constantly... I, w- I would like to just say, most of us are used to um, seeing a brain... Um, when it's been preserved in formaldehyde after it's <laughs> been taken out of somebody's skull after they've died, we hope. But it's this beige blech, lump of... It's not the most attractive organ when you look at it that way. But, um, and, and, and I hate that. I, I, I like to sort of get people to realise that your brain actually is a really vibrant organ. It's made up of 86 billion cells and trillions of connections between them. And all those cells communicate with each other in your brain and with the cells throughout the rest of your body through electrical and chemical signals. So your brain is constantly firing and working. It's a very high energy organ, actually. Um, and the thing is, I'd love to say to your listeners to Google Brainbow. Like rainbow. rainbow, but rainbow. And then they'll see something that gives a sense of the vibrancy of your brain as a living organ. My because producer is just, uh, did you <laughs> he just, just Googled, Googled it. it. It's amazing. That's wow. now, is that not exciting? So what that is, is that that's a fluorescent wow. dye used if, to... I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna, yeah. to repeat that. So uh, just Google just brain Google rainbow. And you'll have a look what, of what I'm looking at here uh, in Dara's laptop as he's, as he's brought it over to us. It is app. It is like some. It is like the. It is like the the northern lights multiplied by about a million. 
it's kind of what I'm looking at. It's kind, it's kind of what I'm looking at. It's absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. In terms of color and vibrancy yeah, and so just that's, life. That's, so they use a fluorescent dye to, 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 to look at neurons and different neurons are, you know, is a general term for the, the cells in your brain, but you've lots of different types of cells and they've got different functions and they color differently through this fluorescence. So you start to see, and you can see the little tails coming out of them. They're kind of a little like balloons as well. They're the connections. So that's really exciting. And I think if people look at that, you start to see that your organ is this wonderful thing. So to get back to your question about screen time, everything you do changes your brain. Um, the thing is really the question about the impact of the internet revolution, for want of a better word, its impact on our brain or brain development is still an open question because the internet sort of developed with because people could do it, the, the technology, without any consideration for unintended consequences. So nobody looked at if we, it's kind of a bit like the atom bomb, it, you know, the, the atom was split and then someone said, oh, we can make a bomb and there we go. Um, similarly, you know, the internet, internet just exploded, exploded and nobody really looked at how it would impact. So from a research perspective, um, there still needs to be a lot of, research done for us to understand the impact. Of course, it will change, you know, because everything you do changes your behavior. Now, we have a lot of observational knowledge. For example, teachers will say kids in school have poor attention spans or that they're functioning in a different way that kids did before the Internet uh, revolution. Now, the thing is, the research to date, um, uh, it doesn't really, well, the problem with the research to date is nobody's actually specifically gone out to research this on a grand scale yet. So what's happened is what we call secondary analysis. So it's data that was collected for some other purpose and then people are looking and seeing can they find relationships. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't have the rigid control of a study that would be looking at the impact of internet on that. But one particular study, which is really quite large using this data, did its best to control for, for some of those more rigidly than some of the other studies. And whilst it does find, a, you know, a negative impact, um, that's like 0.04%. It, it, it's too small to warrant, for example, a change in policy or practice. But that's very broad. If you talk about the internet and screen time, that's very, very broad. Because what do you use your screen for? You use it for your phone, your laptop, your television. Um, you use it for multiple purposes. So we actually need research that is much more specific. Mm -hmm. Because if you're just using the internet to passively consume, you know, videos, uh, you know, TV programs where you're not kind of engaging your brain and challenging yourself. Yes, you know, that's a, your brain needs to be challenged to be healthy, actually, to be perfectly honest. Okay, so it's a, it's a use it or lose it It scenario. really is with your brain. Uh, you know, the muscle analogy actually is very good. Your brain's not a muscle, but use it or lose it absolutely <laughs> applies. But um, the thing is, if somebody is using the internet to do research and find information and solve a problem and figure out, well, then that's challenging your brain. Or if you're using it to write a blog while well, you're being creative. Do, do you know? Mm -hmm. So I think we need to e explore those subtleties. What we do see is differences in terms of kids in school, in terms of reading. Um, so what that research shows that, and, and I think this is where we'll need to kind of get down to context. That research shows that uh, it depends on the purpose of the reading. So if you need to read for detail, you need to read on paper. If you just need the gist of something, actually using a screen may be much more efficient because you can read much more quickly on a screen, provided it's within sort of a screen yeah. size, and you will remember the gist. Wow. So I think we need much more research. So if you're reading detail that you need to absorb or you yeah. read on paper. Yeah. Yeah, and I, there's loads of other tips as well if you want to ins absorb information. Our but yeah, if you were just looking at that, I absolutely hate you for that statement. No, I love. Te no, I no, no, I don't see what's wrong. I mean, I'm I'm super into you know into technology, but I I, I think we need nuances in in terms of That's how we balance. use it. For it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course it is. Um, okay, so let's talk about brain, uh, your brain health, uh, lifestyle. Yes. Like getting, you know, improving the, 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 the health of your brain through kind of simple changes in your life. So what are the top ones? I know sleep is a big thing for you. Sleep is a big thing for everybody. Um, uh, your brain, your brain doesn't go to sleep when you go to sleep. It doesn't rest. It actually has a job of work to do and, and a different job than, than it has during the day. Your brain, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very high energy consumer. In fact, it only weighs 2% of your body, but it consumes about 25% of the nutrients um, that you consume. 
Wow. And you're talking about muscles and eating for your muscles. So two percent of your body weight is brain weight, and it's, and it's using two percent is brain, yeah, brain yeah. weight, and it uses about 25 percent of the, the oxygen and nutrients that you consume. Wow. It's a really high energy organ. So you can imagine then um, that it produces considerable amount of metabolic waste. Uh, now, in your body, when your body produces metabolic waste, it goes through your lymphatic system, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have a lymphatic system in your brain. That net of the lymphatic system doesn't extend to your brain. You know the bad side effects of, you know, if you're not clearing out metabolic waste of your system, you know, you'd be sluggish, sluggish or whatever. So one of the jobs that your brain does at nighttime is actually to give your brain a deep clean during sleep. So it can it can clean a little bit while you're awake, but but just being you, talking, speaking, doing all the stuff that you do requires a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. So it can only do, you know, a light clean, let's say a surface clean that you would do in your house. Oh, someone's coming. Let's do a quick throw all the stuff away <laughs> sort of thing. At night time to get really into those corners and, and clear it all out. Um, sleep is needed for that. And some of the, the you know, the, the proteins that it cleans, cleans out during at night time um, are beta amyloid, which are implicated in um, Alzheimer's disease. Wow. So the other big job that the brain has to do at night when you're asleep is to sort the information that you've taken in during the day, filter it because you can't remember everything. So we see lovely activity, electrical activity in the brain between the hippocampus, which is a seahorse shaped bit of the brain that's right deep in your brain. And it's responsible for learning and memory. And we see electrical activity between that and our frontal lobes, which are the part of your brain that's involved in our really higher order human functions, decision making, planning, organizing, those really complex activity. And we see electrical activity between that in the early part of the night. And we reckon that's the brain filtering information, keep, don't keep, etc. So then what we see in the early part of the night during non-REM sleep is um, sort of div dispersed electrical activity across the brain. So that is the memory starting to be embedded across your brain. So across all those networks that I've been talking mm -hmm. about. Um, and that's when you have, in the early part of the night, when you have more non-REM sleep. In the second half of the night, or what I would personally refer to as the early hours of the morning before you wake, where you have REM sleep. I'm sure your listeners have heard of it. Um, it it's kind of when you, when you dream. That new information that you've taken in is then integrated with your previous and past life experiences. And that's why if you have good night's sleep, you can wake up with insight, ideas, the solutions to a problem. So like neuroscience supports mm -hmm. the old adage, you know, sleep on it. Um, so it's really critical for people, you know, if you want to take in new information or consolidate it, sleep is critical for that too. And is there a, uh, from research and studies, is there an actual time limit or time frame? Should it be the magical eight hours or does it depend on quality over quantity or is so there kind of a magic that's, number? That's really important. It's both quality and quality. Quantity. So you do need the amount of sleep, um, but the quality of the sleep is important, deep sleep, and, and that you get both ends. Like mm -hmm. if you're getting up too early and not, you're not getting an REM, you know, you'll, you'll see consequences. It actually depends on your age. Um, so sort of adults, 24 to 60, yeah, between the seven to nine. Um, but actually teens should be... Nine hours, oh my God. No, seven, well, what I say sort of seven, seven to nine, the average would be eight. Some people, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, need more. And actually, as you get older, but... Um, we have we, we, we a, a new baby, so that's why I heard nine hours. It's like, oh my God, nine hours sleep. Yeah, Wouldn't that be amazing? Love it? <laughs> but your baby needs a lot of sleep. <laughs> and and young sure. children need a lot of sleep. And I don't think they're getting enough sleep. Um, and teenagers need far more sleep than they get. They only need about 10 hours sleep. Do you know any teenager getting that kind of sleep? Um, yeah. They sleep at a different time. We've different... Our chronotype, which is when you wake like you've heard of owls and larks, mm -hmm. um, that changes across our lifespan. So teenagers are more likely to be owls and their brain, their cognitive function is actually much better later in the evening. So we're trying to pigeonhole them to get up and go to school early in the morning mm -hmm. when actually their brain functions better later in the day. And that flips when we get older. A lot of older people will wake earlier in the day and they'll be sharper earlier in the day and their, their functioning will be declined. But that is one thing that would bother me about internet use is its interference with sleep. Uh, because the blue light that is emitted from all of our devices um, suppresses the release of melatonin, um, which is a chemical that's released in the brain that calls you to, to go to sleep. So, um, yeah, and a lot of people have a lot of technology in their bedroom yes. and right before they go we, to sleep. We fly the flag for Tech Free Bedroom on the Real Health Podcast. We always have done. We've had, for every expert we've had in, and I'm with, uh, 
15 minutes in, putting you into an expert category. The difference of having a, an expert in their field on, absolutely amazing when they come in and talk about a topic. They're so passionate about it. Yeah. But Tech Free Bedroom, everyone, they're all yeah. across the board. It is the one thing that comes up in conversation after conversation. Get yourself an old-fashioned alarm clock. Yeah, exactly. And that's the, that's the first excuse people yeah. have. Oh, I have no alarm clock. I get an old-fashioned alarm clock because you fall, <laughs> not only do you get the light waking you up, you fall, oh, I've got five new notifications yeah, and you're course. gone uh, and, you, and you're awake, you know. Um, but physical exercise is one of the best things you can do for your brain health. People, it's funny, I give a lot of talks around brain health and it's a new topic for people and people often say, oh, I think I'm pretty good. I do lots of Sudoku and, and crossword puzzles. And I go, well, no, it, your brain is an organ and, and it needs to be looked after as such. So physical exercise is superb for your brain health. As I said, it needs that oxygen um, and nutrients and, and a good cardiovascular, healthy mm-hmm. cardiovascular system will help to deliver those. Um, if your cardiovascular system is compromised in any way, your brain will be deprived in areas of your brain. You may lose brain cells, etc. cetera. Um, but also physical exercise causes the release of hormones in the brain that actually promote promote the growth of, of brain cells and they promote neuroplasticity, which is, you know, um, the brain's ability to change with learning. It's fundamental to what we're talking mm-hmm. about, the new connections and having more dense connections. So physical exercise releases this um, and encourages the release of this um, BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor. You don't need to learn that. Brain I call it derived neurotrophic, neurotrophic factor. factor. There we and go. I just, your new word for the day. Just, word from, for the day. just think of it about like miracle grow for the brain. <laughs> That's exactly what it's like. Okay. And that comes from physical exercise. It's brilliant. America, I love that. It's cool. Uh, folks, you are listening to the Real Health Podcast in association with Leia Healthcare with me, Carl Henry. This is the second of our Health Masterclass episodes. We're chatting all thing, things brain health and uh, brain aging. So sleep is massive. Yes. Um, stress. Stress yes. management. Let's talk about stress and the impact of stress on the brain. Yeah, so managing stress is important. And I think stress has um, gets a bad rap. Stress in and of itself is not bad for your brain. Uh, it's poorly managed chronic stress that impacts negatively on your brain. In in fact, you know, like all of our behaviours, they, they, they have survived because they serve a purpose, you know, through evolution. And stress, actually, the release of cortisol and the stress response, um, we think of it mo- mainly in the, in the fight or flight response. Mm-hmm. But it's also, I mentioned earlier, that challenging your brain is really good for your brain, learning new things, um, uh, having new experiences. Um, and in order to do that, to challenge yourself, you actually need that release of adrenaline and cortisol. So actually, you know, it's, it, you know, having an optimal amount of stress in your life is beneficial for your brain health. Uh, and in- interestingly, uh, when I won't go into the whole, you know, stress response, you know, adrenaline is released, but also cortisol is released. And it actually goes to the hippocampus that I mentioned earlier, the seahorse shaped part of the brain responsible for learning and memory. And in an acute stress response, when you're in a situation, say you're being attacked or, you know, something's happening, um, that release of cortisol enhances memory. And that makes perfect sense because you need to remember not to go down that dark alley or how you escaped. OK, now the, that that whole stress system has a fabulous negative feedback loop where a message then gets sent to the brain after that stress has passed that says enough already. We're done with the stress. Cut off the cortisol. Now, what seems to happen with chronic, poorly managed stress is that negative feedback loop. That message doesn't happen and cortisol continues to be released into the hippocampus. When that happens, it prevents the growth of new brain cells. It impairs neuroplasticity so you can't grow new brain connections so you actually start to have a shrinking that of the bra- of that part of the brain and your ability to learn and to remember become compromised um, so similarly what doesn't get spoken about often enough is that a understimulated brain too little stress is really bad for your brain as well. And is that a concern in term, on a societal level? Uh, you read more and more about people trying to reduce stress in younger age groups. So, mm-hmm. for example, when, every, when the Leaving Cert's on now, there's huge amounts of, of media written about, oh, you know, we, we need to reduce the stress levels of, of teenagers, make it an easier system. I suppose life generally uh, for that age group, they're trying to reduce the amount of stress 
that previous generations would have gone through. Is that a concern in terms of ageing? I well, yes, aging? yes. I mean, if you but but I'm, I'm not so sure. Sort of leaving cert stress is the kind of level that we're talking about. I think we should be teaching um, our kids how to how to manage stress and and how to rise to, to see things as a challenge rather than a negative. Because learning is a challenge and it's exciting and and it's good for you. Um, and and achievement is good because after you achieve, you know, you you get through an exam, you do it, you get a rush, you get reward. So I'm not so sure. Maybe Making things too easy is a good idea. However, if you have really traumatic, stressful experience, if you have, you know, experienced abuse at a child or you're, you've lost parents or that kind of thing, yes, that can change actually how your brain responds to stress in the future. Do you know? Mm-hmm. So like teenage years are critical, you know. So teaching kids, you know, how to manage stress in those years can help set up good habits for later life. But yes, but things can be relearned. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's easy, but you can relearn um, how to do it. But too little stress uh, is not good. And that really can come with retirement uh, and with unemployment um, and people just coasting along with life. That's not good for brain because your brain can't force to waste energy on neurons that aren't being used. And so you'll actually probably be accelerating the, the rate of atrophy if you're not doing enough. So stress yourself out somewhat. Well, yeah. challenge yourself challenge is the yourself. way I yeah. like to see it. Because then in terms of managing stress, I, I always say to people, close your eyes for a minute and think about that feeling you get in your gut when you're stressed. And then I say, OK, now forget about that. Now close your eyes and think about that feeling you get in your gut when you're excited. And I just say to them, what's the difference? There's no difference. It's identical. And, a lo- you know, we've a lot of control over how we think about things. So switching things up um, and you've no control over big stresses in your life. If somebody dies, or, you know, if you have money troubles, but you do have control over how you respond to that stress. Um, would that stretch to your view on the world in terms of optimism versus pessimism? Yeah, absolutely. They kind of do play a role as well. And also psychological stress. It doesn't matter whether there's a real stressor or not. It's irrelevant. If you just think that things are beyond your ability to cope, well, then you're going to that stress response is going to release. So it actually doesn't matter whether there's an external stressor or not once you think there is. So that's where that if you flip that, that's where you have power and control because you can flip you, who controls your thoughts, actually only you. Um, and so it is around that. But physical exercise, again, and I'm not saying it just because you're here, but physical exercise is one of the great ways to boost uh, to to um, deal with, to manage stress, and actually also to boost um, to boost sleep. And does that tie in with I suppose overall health? So, for example, if you have high blood pressure, obesity, uh, yes. low cardiovascular fitness levels, um, type two diabetes, all those kind of medical issues that come with poor health from lack of exercise yes. and, and eating poorly. Is there a link between those and brain health? Yes, there is. And actually, there's a link, not just in terms of, you know, brain health and, and ageing, but there's a link with uh, with dementia, with, with disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It affects about 34 million people globally. Um, uh, and we know that up to 30% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease are attributable to just seven modifiable risk factors. So lifestyle factors, things that you can do something about. You've named some of them. A lot of them are related to your heart. So what's good for your heart is good for your brain. I mentioned it earlier, your heart really is a pump that services your brain. and It's got to be kept in good working order. So type 2 diabetes increases your risk for developing dementia, midlife obesity, uh, midlife high blood pressure, low le- physical inactivity, um, low levels of education or mental stimulation, you know, that under stimulation mm-hmm. I was talking about, depression and smoking. So you can see actually five of those seven are all related to cardiovascular health. So look after your heart and that is a way to look after your brain. Um, And I would advise anyone listening, go get your blood pressure tested because it's poorly managed high blood pressure. And there's a lot of people walking around with high blood pressure that they don't know that they have because there's no real symptoms for it. Um, But, you know, and it's it's, it's easy to manage then through lifestyle choices or through medication if your doctor thinks to go that far. And are there any signs of brain aging like red flag not even red flags but signs or symptoms that you could look out for yourself as as you get older or is that a very strange question it, well yeah it kind of is we all yeah and it, it, it kind of depends how, how you define it like a lot of people assume and I would make this very clear as people get older um, decline in cognitive function like memory is not a normal part of aging disease is the cause of most decline but 
one good news piece is that if you live a brain healthy life, the healthier your brain is, even if you do get the disease, you will be able to hold on to your functioning for longer. Mm -hmm. That applies even if you get a brain injury or if you get a disease early in life, such as multiple sclerosis. The healthier your brain is, the more your brain will be able to cope. Um, the thing is, as we get older, um, as well, another thing that that the what we a lot of people refer to as lapses of memory are actually probably more likely attributable to lapses of attention, to absent mindedness. Mm -hmm. We fail to live in the present. Uh, a lot of us live on autopilot. You know, um, some people will say busy mind. You're just thinking about everything else except the thing that you're doing. Um, the thing is, if you live present in the moment, you are attending to what you're doing while you're doing it. Now, attention is the first step in the memory making process. So you can't go. So if you take something simple like coming in, throwing your keys down, most people when they come in, keys are down, they're sort of, I'd be kicking off my shoes, we're going, is there anything in the fridge? Or wait, I tell you, your man just cut me off on such and such a thing. And you're not thinking about what you're doing. You're not attending to where you put the keys. So then you can't encode that memory. That memory then when you go to sleep at night hasn't been encoded, so it can't be consolidated and within your brain. And then you really have no hope in hell of recalling a memory that you never consolidated. So that's the classic of, I can't find my keys. Well, you can't find yeah. your keys because you have no memory of where you place them. Because, because you didn't encode a memory because you mindlessly engaged. Right. So I always say that to people. If a lot of people, you know, people are concerned because um, I know that from research I've done, you, you know, ask people what they fear most about growing old and they say they fear losing their independence and they fear losing their memory and dementia is the disease that they fear most. And so they tend to catastrophize uh, and say, oh my God, I'm forgetting this and I'm forgetting that. Um, but I, I would suggest that if they look after, you know, start focusing more on, on training their attention, they may see less. We do have a general slowing as we age, but that's the same as the slowing we experience physically. Mm -hmm. And people will allow for that. People will say, oh, give us a chance. I can't get out of this chair as quick <laughs> as I used to, or I can't cross the road as quick as I used to. But people get angry with themselves if they can't find a word as quick as they used to. And then what happens is stress response is kicked off. And that will interfere with your ability to call, recall the word you're looking for. So you just got to relax, give yourself permission that your cognitive processing takes a little longer. But the really good news is all the research shows that you are, remain just as accurate as younger people. So it's the same. And I mean, it applies to in terms of um, physical exercise, like people so, sort of will say to me and they tend to think about aerobic exercise. And that really is beneficial in terms of the way I've been talking about your brain health. Um, but it's really, really important right across the lifespan to uh, work on strength building exercises and on balance. Um, a lot of people say, and they smile at me because I get a lot of older audience as well. And, you know, people say, oh, you, you lose muscle, you lose your muscles when with age, you lose your muscles because you stop using mm -hmm. your muscles. Um, and again, I would suggest people Google, you know, there's a woman, Ernestine, she's a personal trainer. She's 82 years of age. Oh, I've heard of her. Yes. You know her? Yes. She yes. took up weightlifting at 56. Um, and there's another guy called Charles Uxter. Um, he was a retired dentist. He first took up running, I think. And then he took up weightlifting and he became more world champion in both of them and they have muscles and ripped and not that everybody needs to do that but actually we do need to um, to carry out those activities and again that's modern life has kind of changed how we do that if you look at if you look at what they call the, the blue zones in the world mm -hmm. where a lot of people live to 100 and yep. fit and healthy and good, they're all still active. You know, they're not necessarily going to the gym, but they're engaging in tasks move. and activities that they move and, and work on. And it's a simple switch for you. Now, for, this is just from, from reading it through articles. It, it's switching from your dominant hand to your less dominant hand. For, for example, you know, brushing your teeth with your left hand as opposed to your right yeah. hand. Or I think I read that same article. Yeah, or, yeah, the, <laughs> or is that absolute nonsense? Well, I don't. <laughs> See, yeah, no, I don't really see. Mo nonsense. Most of what I talk about in my, in my book is built on a lot of, you know, yeah, a lot of yeah. evidence. There's single little studies that you can find on these things. Um, no, what's the, in, in a way, I mean, I, what I would suggest if you want to do something while you're brushing your teeth, that's something that's really good, is to actually do it while bal balancing on, on one, one foot, foot in yes. the morning yeah. and balance on the other foot in the evening. Then you're going to actually be working on your balance. If you want to do something to challenge your brain, how about do something that you really love or something, you know, that rather than, oh, I'm going to try 
brushing my teeth with my left hand. Why not try, you know, learning the violin if you've always wanted to do that, right? Why not take up woodwork? Why, mm -hmm. you, do you know, do something that actually is stimulating and yeah. improves the quality of your life. And, you know, that's, that's kind of key. And your attitude, you mentioned it earlier about optimism. Attitude is key. Attitude actually imp impacts on, you know, brain function and, and on mental health And as that's well. a simple decision to be more optimistic, be more positive, surround yourself with positive people and work on it. Yeah, you can work on it. Tell us about your book, uh, 100 Days to a Younger Brain, Maximise Your Memory, Boost Your Brain Health and Defy Dementia. Well, we've been talking about yeah. a, a lot of what's in it. Um, what the book really, um, and I do want to tell people, I have a lot of free resources online, little animated films, etc. that, you know, um, if people have fears about memory loss that they can find out. And I give a lot of talks and I give those sort of generic tips that I've been giving to you. Um, but everybody's brain is different. Um, your brain is unique because nobody has had the life experiences that you have had. So this book is a very practical book. So, for example, there's a chapter on sleep, but you will complete questionnaires about your own sleep profile. Mm -hmm. you, so, so you essentially build your sleep profile and your stress profile and you figure out where, because some of us will be brilliant at certain aspects that influence brain health, but terrible at others. So essentially what you do is you work through the program is you, brain, you build your current brain health profile and then you develop a plan uh, to work on integrating and developing those new habits to improve your brain health. Um, uh, available in all good bookstores? All good bookstores and it's also available um, on Amazon and it's in print uh, ebook and it's also in audiobook and I read the audiobook. Oh, wow. So a lot of people, you know, might like to listen. So the way we've done the audiobook is you listen to all the chapters and then you can download a PDF with all the assessments. And if people want to follow you on social media? Yes, as uh, at Sabina underscore Brennan on Twitter. And then if they want to find materials uh, that I mentioned that are free, um, sabinabrennan.ie. And there's links to all of those. Amazing. There. Dr. Sabina Brennan, thank you so much for joining us on The Real Health Podcast. That has been a fascinating 30 minutes. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Totally new, totally different and really, really interesting for our listeners. So thank you so much. Folks, you are listening to The Real Health Podcast in association with Lion Health here. Don't forget, we have our wonderful competition running to celebrate breaking the million listen mark in the first year of The Real Health Podcast. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for listening in. And as a present, we have Fitbits, we have books, we have lots of lovely prizes to give away. So to be in with a chance of winning, go to The Real Health Podcast page on independent.ie and fill out the survey and you're in with a chance. It ends the end of July. Have a wonderful day. Apply lots of those principles, and uh, we shall see you next week. Slonga Paul. Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of the Real Health Podcast with Carl Henry.